You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. As many of you know, I was in British Columbia last week doing filming and production on Assaulted, Justin Trudeau's war on gun owners. And and while I was in BC, I I had a down afternoon, not sad, but I mean, I didn't have anything scheduled. So I decided to catch up with an old friend of mine, Aaron Gunn, who has done tremendous work around BC and I would say around the country advocating first for taxpayer interests. And and he's since broadened that to a lot of other solid small C conservative ideas. And he is looking to take the leap from independent media to politics, musing a run for the leadership of the BC Liberal Party. Now, as far as BC politics goes, the BC Liberals tend to be the more electable conservative-ish party, but the ish is doing a lot of heavy lifting there, as we'll talk about with Aaron. There's a lot of overlap between the BC Liberals and the federal conservatives, But there's also some overlap between the B.C. Liberals and the federal Liberals. So the question comes down to, can this be a Conservative Party? And is that enough to get a Conservative government in British Columbia? Lots to chew on. Here's my interview with potential B.C. Liberal leadership candidate, Aaron Gunn. Aaron Gunn, he's been a friend of True North. Good to talk to you. It's great to be here. So let's start right out of the gate. Are you running for the leadership of the B.C. Liberals? I am seriously considering it. I'm doing my due diligence. Uh, The rules just came out uh, pretty recently and uh, something that we're considering. I was uh, been inundated with with messages and both on Facebook and emails and texts from from friends and supporters encouraging me to to do something with the sad state of affairs of BC politics. And it's something I'm taking really seriously. Why would you want to? I mean, this is, I think, a big question that you've yourself been on the forefront of criticizing the state of BC politics, of politics in general, and of the BC Liberal Party. You've got a great thing going for you right now, talking about the issues. Why decide to jump into this? Well, that's a great question. Uh, Already, I've seen in just the last couple of weeks since my name started being rumored, there's the, uh, you know, the attacks over social media, the the, uh, character assassinations, Press Progress did a big piece on me. So that is a great question, and uh, I ask myself that sometimes. But on the other hand, in the last provincial election, I was sitting back and watching it. I'm a resident of British Columbia. I was born here. I was raised here, and it was just frankly pathetic. There were there was two choices, the NDP and the NDP light. And uh, the NDP light, of course, being the BC Liberal Party. There was no vision articulated for the province. Voters were not given a choice, a real choice, and it's something that that I think needs to change. I know that for people that aren't in BC, they might be a little bit confused. Hey, Andrew, you're supposed to be on the right. Why are you talking to a guy who wants to run for the leadership of the BC Liberals? You actually acknowledged that. You had posted something on Facebook when there was a movement afoot to try to draft you into politics in which you said that you think the name of the party is actually holding it back from what you'd want to see it as. Yeah, the name of the party needs to go. It's a really weird history, but the uh... There's basically a two-party system here in British Columbia, other than other than the Green Party. You have the NDP, and then you basically have the anti-NDP party. That's a center-right coalition. Now, why they called it the BC Liberals is a long story. But uh, what is true is that there's no reason for the BC Liberal name to exist now. Uh, for example, if we wanted to enter a doubles tennis tournament, uh, and we're like, well, let's come up with a name for our team, we wouldn't say, okay, well, let's call it Team Andrew. Like that wouldn't be a very wouldn't make a lot of sense. Or Team Aaron. So I think that it uh, needs a new name, one that can be inclusive of everybody that's in the coalition. The majority of members and voters of the party are federal conservatives. So uh, that's kind of the one of the tasks I look forward to potentially taking on. That's actually an important point you raised, though, because I, I've never been completely confident that it is the case. But you think that the federal conservative DNA is really the majority of the BC Liberal DNA? Well, I would say the majority of voters for the BC, of the BC Liberal Party are federal conservatives. They've done kind of those uh, studies, and I would say the membership as well. Now, one of the problems is the party apparatus and mm. the insiders behind the party. Um, I don't know if it matters if they're technically federal conservatives or federal liberals. I don't even know if they know any more themselves. But one thing is that they're consumed with, with, with power um, and, and kind of, you know, having their team win as opposed to actually coming up with and implementing public policy that that works for British Columbians and works for taxpayers. 
That's, I think, very key here because we saw in Alberta this happen where you had a party in the PC party of Alberta that went unchallenged for years and years. And by the end of its run, there was very little that was recognizably conservative about it because it became a, a party about power. And the BC Liberals have had that mantle for quite a while, up until just a, a couple of years ago. So there is, I think, an opportunity that that presents for a reset. Yeah, that's right. I think, you know, just like you mentioned with Alberta, this seems to happen, you know, every couple of decades where parties get get tired, the establishment gets, uh, I don't want to, corrupt might be a little bit too strong of a word, but uh, there's a certain malaise that, that, that hangs over it when it comes to public policy and new ideas. And that needs to change. It needs to be reinvigorated. It needs to be rebranded and it needs to be re-energized. So that's something that, that myself or at the very least an outsider uh, should be coming into the party uh, to provide. When we hear about that term outsider, I think it's become a bit romanticized in a way, this notion of just someone swooping in who doesn't have experience in elected office. And I, and I don't want to downplay what you have done because you've certainly covered politics and you've you've worked in the political system more broadly, but you're not an MLA. You're not a member of parliament. You are coming at this without having that conventional track towards seeking the leadership and, and ultimately the pre premiership. Why should people overlook that? Why should people overlook what they would view as a lack of experience and say, yeah, this guy could run the province? Well, I think it's about experience is important, but even more importantly is having the right kind of experience. So you look at a lot of the people in the BC Liberal Party right now or people that are rumored to also be running. Uh, a lot of these people were involved in bringing in the first carbon tax in North America. I don't think that's the kind of experience that we need. A lot of them were involved with the, the money laundering and the housing bubble that had affordability go completely out the window for British Columbians. There's the ICBC insurance monopoly that was run to the ground. So it's important to have experience. Obviously I've been you know, talking about and communicating issues that are important for British Columbians and Canadians for, you know, since I left university going to the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. But I think even more importantly is having the right kind of experience and having, you know, not having that baggage. Because uh, I guess that's, you know, the other side of that coin. Yeah, it is. And, and I think you're bang on there. And I would also say just for people outside BC, there tends to be this caricature of British Columbia where I think we define it those of us who aren't from BC as, as what downtown Vancouverites think. And, and I, you've heard this all before, the left coast and you know the image of the BC hippie. But, but in BC, there is, first off, a lot more of a diverse province than I, I think a lot of people outside realize. But a lot of people that are similarly frustrated at all those things you just mentioned, the carbon tax, the housing situations, even if they don't identify a, as conservative politically, would probably align with someone that's bringing a, a small c conservative vision to the province's politics. Yeah, and it's not about conservative or liberal. I get asked this question a lot. It's about common sense. It's about public policy that works for people. It's about, uh, you know, uh, realism in public policy. So, and, and you're exactly right about the Vancouver disconnect from downtown Vancouver, uh, either with the suburbs around Vancouver, whether that's Surrey, whether that's Langley, the interior, Kelowna, Kamloops, the north and Prince George, where most, most of the mineral and oil and natural gas wealth comes from, or on Vancouver Island, where uh, people feel completely ignored. So I do think that uh, what you say is exactly correct. And there's that disconnect uh, in downtown Vancouver with, with the rest of the province, which I'm sure is similar to uh, Toronto and much of that province and Montreal and much of uh, Quebec, et cetera. Yes, and I, I don't know if every province has that. Certainly in Ontario, it, you see that dynamic where people feel that the decisions are made by a few square kilometers in the Toronto area. and that's where the population is. And I'm assuming BC is, is very much like that as well. So how do you break through that with a, a vision that, and I, I'm looking beyond the leadership right now, assume you were the leader of the Liberals, uh, you're, you're running province-wide, how do you break beyond that regional imbalance and, and put a vision forward that is not gonna scare people away, but at the same time is gonna be solid to these principles that you've espoused for years? Well, I think, a couple of things. I think one thing is in the cities, and we talk about Vancouver, people that are living outside the downtown core are equally frustrated with the decisions um, coming from those downtowns, people that are living in the rural areas. So in Vancouver, for example, you have these tent cities that have been completely out of control. You have city councils in Victoria that have tore down statues of Sir John A. Macdonald, for example, that have um, instituted uh, insane policies towards uh, harm reduction, quote unquote, harm reduction that have failed spectacularly. They're pretty much 
have taxpayer funded uh, heroin injection sites. So these kind of policies I think have failed and people inside the cities and outside are equally frustrated. So that's I think how you connect with them and you try to provide a pan British Columbian vision that everybody can get behind. What is your vision for the party? Well, first of all is to change the name. I think that has to happen because you need a new name. Um, you need a new leader, but you need a new name to really turn, uh, turn the page on this, you know, the, the history of the party and to tell conservatives who, some of whom stayed home last election and broke off and voted for the BC Conservative Party that they are welcome back into the tent. So that's, that's number one. Number two, you have to get cost of living under control. And you have to realize that's, you know, a number one priority for many British Columbians and their families that don't necessarily have all the time to chat about all the nuances of, of politics, but you know, they're trying to feed their families and afford their mortgage payments. And that, that means the housing uh, bubble and the housing crisis, that means repealing the carbon tax, that means reining in the ICBC auto insurance monopoly, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think you gotta stand up to city councils that have gone completely out of control. You, I think you need to get the pipelines built to power this economy, whether it's TMX or Coastal Gas Link or putting, putting Northern Gateway back on the table. I think you need to support forestry, resources, uh, you have to protect our constitutional rights and you have to rein in um, as well some of these universities like the University of British Columbia that does not respect free speech and freedom of assembly in this province. And I think as a taxpayer funded institution, that's completely unacceptable. The resource issue is huge because whenever we have these discussions in Canada, even when the Liberals are on board, the federal Liberals in Canada are on board, BC is the sticking point. And, and I refuse to believe that the average British Columbian is against the jobs, the uh, reduction in dependence on foreign oil that are all inherently uh, byproducts of the attacks on Canada's oil sector. Why has there not been a voice in BC politics that has been able to be pro-energy really in a, a, a bold way? Well, you're 100% right in that if you look at every poll, uh, the majority of British Columbians support the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. A huge majority of British Columbians support the Coastal Gas Link Natural Gas Pipeline. By the way, all 20 elected First Nation bands along the pipeline route also support that mm -hmm. project. Um, I think what you're missing is you're missing a politician with backbone who isn't afraid to champion Canadian oil and natural gas and say, you know what, this actually makes the world a better place. As long as we need oil in the world, as much of that oil as possible should be coming from Canada. When it comes to natural gas, that's good for the environment in, in every way imaginable because you're sending it off to China to help displace uh, coal. So I, I think you need a champion who isn't afraid uh, to stand up for his principles, isn't going to back down because they're scared of you know a bad headline with the CBC um, and really sticks to his gun. So that's what I think has been missing uh, is, is, a, is a champion for those issues and as you mentioned energy. What are the factors weighing on your mind as you decide whether to go through with this? Well right now as I mentioned we're doing our due diligence looking at the rules looking at election BC rules um, and for me, a lot of it's timing. As you mentioned, I've got uh, just started a new show, Politics Explained. Uh, have my online branding and have been expanding really rapidly. Um, and this isn't my first choice uh, of, of time to get involved into politics. I've chatted openly with individuals like yourself, other people in the movement. As you know, I'm a, a movement guy. Um, about how one day, you know, down the road, I might get involved into politics. But why I might be getting involved now is just the genuine frustration with lack of choices. There's just, there's no choices articulating these values, articulating an actual vision for this province. And if somebody stepped up to the plate that I thought, you know, checked all those boxes, I'd be more than happy to support them from the sidelines and continue doing my thing. So it's a long runway. The vote's not till February, 2022. And uh, so one of the reasons why is I'm waiting to see if somebody actually gets in and starts articulating uh, you know, those things in which I believe and which I think, you know, a large number of British Columbians believe as well. When you look at the landscape of BC politics, is the issue that the people that you've just described don't exist or is it that they exist but are just not wanting to seek a leadership role at this point or, or don't think it's viable for them to do so? Well, I think there's a lot of apathy in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. I think 
the the British Columbia Liberal Party has just, as I mentioned earlier, there's kind of a malaise has been has been set be set on top of them. There's been no kind of new ideas, and then I think also, you know, who, who would want to get involved in politics now? If you, if they, yeah, I mean, it goes back to the I, first question yeah, of why I mean, on earth do you want this? <laughs> if you had a successful career in the private sector, yeah. why would you possibly want to get involved in politics and take the 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 torrent of abuse that you're inevitably going to receive? So I think that's, uh, you know, I think that deters a lot of people. For whatever reason, my brain has been been wired in such a way where, you know, that's something that I that I can deal with, or, or my my skin is thick enough. Um, but for me, honestly, it's not really it's not really that that I want to do it, or it seems like a great opportunity. It's that I'm tired of sitting on the sidelines. Uh, I remember sitting there during the last provincial election, watching the debate, and just being like, "Is this the best we can do?" I really think, you know, British Columbia, third biggest province in confederation, uh, plays a very important role in these, you know, constitutional debates regarding infrastructure like pipelines. And I really think it needs better leadership. And this is not a publicity stunt. If you do this, you're a serious candidate. 100%. I'm only going into this to win. Uh, if, I, if I go into it and make the final call, uh, we've already got, you know, a team together that's, that's discussing the possibilities. And, uh, you know, like I said, we have to do our due diligence, but uh, there's no publicity stunt. Trust me, we did the, uh, we did the you know, cost benefit analysis and this would be uh, much too of, uh, there's much too, in, too much incoming that I would receive specifically, as you've seen with the, the press progress report, where I would be doing this for, for mere uh, publicity. I try not to put too much faith in anything press progress writes, but in that story, they talk about a few few of the so-called expert brigade that uh, you know tends to think that the rules might be stacked against you and you might not even be allowed to run. Is that a, a serious risk or is that just press progress being press progress? Well, look, I, there's lots of rumors flying around. There are people within the party that don't want me to run because you know they found their candidate they want and they don't want to have an actual exchange of ideas. They don't want to have an actual debate about policy. They don't want the carbon tax to come up again. They think that's, you know, yeah. you know, a settled issue. To, to have someone like you on a debate stage in a party leadership, forcing candidates to defend the indefensible if they are pro-carbon tax or don't want to have the discussion it is dangerous for them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, I, and I, I really, not only do I think that that's not true, I actually think that's harmful to the party. I Absolutely. think the party needs to have a robust discussion. It needs to have a robust debate. And look, I'm not looking to go personal after everybody, but when it comes to policy, we should be able to have frank conversations. Mm -hmm. And I was just meeting with someone the other day who said, no, we need this to be like, uh, they referenced an old NDP leadership race where it's like a family affair and everyone's just kind of patting each other on the back. And that's not what I think you need to do after you suffer a humiliating election defeat. I think you really need to take a look in the mirror and hash it out about a path forward uh, for this party. And that's what I think is needed. And some people don't like that fact because they're probably cozy with their little mm -hmm. enclaves of power that they've carved out for themselves in the existing party. And that's fine. I understand that I represent change and change is a threat to, to some people. And the problem if you are approaching this from a grassroots perspective, which you are, is that the people that set out the rules for these things are not representative always of the grassroots. They're a committee of party faithful. And, and this is not a, a, yeah. a swipe, swipe at this particular committee. It's just yeah. in general, this is how these things work. So I would be very leery of anyone who ever said that it's not the party members who get to decide whether you deserve to be standing in this race. I agree 100%. And look, I, I don't know the members on that committee. Uh, I try to follow... I, practice in life where I assume the best until, you know, provided with evidence that... that well, you're not going to fly in politics yeah. if that's your attitude, but uh, until, carry on. <laughs> until provided with evidence uh, yeah. of the contrary. And right now it's just rumors and speculation. I know that they're trying to, I think the other campaigns are trying to for, push that narrative forward because it makes me seem like some kind of extreme candidate or something like that, which I don't think is, uh, is obviously not true at all. So, um, yeah, I mean, and look, here's the other thing. This is why I really don't think it's going to happen. If you say that I can't be part of this party, if you say someone like me cannot be part of this leadership race, you're saying hundreds of thousands of British Columbians who support me or support the policies that I espouse have no place in this party. And if you're doing that, you're signing your own death warrant, as far as I'm concerned. So I don't think that they would be that dumb to do that. But... 
I mean, you never know. But as, as far as I'm concerned, I, I haven't heard anything, you, you know, directly from them or anything like that. So uh, I'm looking at the glass uh, half full for now. But again, there's uh, this party, they say it's a coalition party and they want to have, uh, they want to have rejuvenation. Well, let's, you know, put your money where, where their mouth is, hopefully. I guess that would be the last thing I'd want to ask you about then, Aaron, because it is a coalition party. And in these, te- in these sorts of arrangements, there's a risk that one just consumes the other rather than the two coexisting. In your view, is the BC Liberals' future going to be about the battle between the right flank and the left flank? Or do you think there is a a unified vision that you or, or in general, someone could put forward that keeps both sides happy. So right now that unified vision doesn't exist. So right now the party's foundation is built on a concept of just a coalition between federal liberals and federal conservatives to keep out the NDP. I think that is, that is a tired. And there's not a fall. There's not a philosophical basis. There's no philosophical core. And I think that's, you know, that's an alliance that was made in the late or in the 1990s that no longer has any relevance. Look, let's be honest. Uh, Justin Trudeau's federal liberal government is to the left of the provincial NDP on a number of issues. So that makes like deficit financing, for example. So that makes this alliance really quite awkward. What I think you need to do is on the center right of the political spectrum, uh, create a new party or reform this existing party with its own independent vision that yes is a home for federal conservatives that yes is a home for many federal liberals but it can also get you know people that might have not traditionally voted before maybe people that had voted ndp before or voted green before similar to the old social credit party which dominated bc politics for decades aaron gunn independent journalist potential contender for the bc liberal leadership thanks very much for sitting down thank you for having me andrew Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.